So bear with me. I'm going to try to guide us through chapter 15. Um, I just want to pray real quick. Father God, I just thank you so very much for giving us the opportunity to come together as your children, as um, believers in Jesus, and just to learn about you and to share who you are and what you've done for us. I just ask that you be my words, just um, guide me into everything that I say and have and open our hearts to hear what you want us to hear. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so when we left off last time, Eloise was telling us about Paul and Barnabas um, in Antioch continuing to strengthen the church. So we're just going to pick up there in chapter 15, 1. It says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching their brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, in Ecclesiastes 1, 9, it says that there is nothing new under the sun. And that was true in Acts 15, and it's true today. And... Um, you have the far right and the far left, and I'm not even speaking of the world. I'm speaking of the people that call themselves of the church. These men that were commanding the Gentiles to be circumcised, they um, were more than likely Jewish Christians that had walked closely with um, closely to the Pharisees' teachings, doing and saying what they believed that God had instructed them to do. In the early church, they would have been called Judaizers. <coughs> Judaizers, the word comes from the Greek verb meaning to live according to Jewish customs. In their eyes, the Gentiles had to become Jewish proselytes first before they could come to Christ. The doctrine of the Judaizers were a mixture of grace through Christ and the works through the keeping of the law. So as learners of Jesus, we must know who we are allowing to speak into our lives, um, especially when it comes to what the Word says. So even tonight, if there's something that I say that your spirit has a check in, it's like you don't agree with that, then read it for yourself. You know, go home and read that and see what the Lord tells you. Um Many people say that the Bible doesn't make sense, and it didn't to me, For and it still doesn't sometimes. Sorry. <coughs> but um, there's so many different versions of the Bible, and we have Holy Spirit. And so he is what we always go to in prayer and ask him to lead us and guide us and open up our minds to what he has. Because every word that was written was inspired by Holy Spirit. So if anyone knows, it's going to be him. So um, many, let me see, sorry. And so the big difference between us and then is we have the Bible. They didn't. They had to rely on people for the most part to tell them what it said. So as we continue reading, there was a great debate between these men that were commanding the Gentiles and Paul and Barnabas. Well, this debate arose, and when nothing was settled, it tells us in verse 2 that Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. And picking up in verse 4, it says, When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them, but some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders were gathered together to consider this matter. So Charles Scribner's dictionary says, The ideal scribe was both the student and teacher of the law of the Most High. However, they more than interpreted Scripture. They added many man-made traditions to the to what God had said. They focused more on being a dictator of the law than the intent of the Spirit behind it. They considered the regulations and traditions 
that added they added to be more important than the law itself. The Pharisees and teachers were strictly the Pharisees were teachers that strictly followed the law of Moses and the customs of the interpreta- and the interpretations that they and the scribes had come up with, devouring anyone that disagreed with them. The one last thing that I want, was wanting to talk about here is the word hell used here is not referring to eternal hell. When it says child of hell, Jesus would have actually said child of Johanna. Johanna is a Greek name for the Hinnom Valley that's located south of the Jerusalem city walls, and it served as a city dump. And so that's where they would have um, put all the waste and the carcasses to burn and um, rotted. <coughs> so Jesus often used Johanna to, as an image to con- contrast the, the kingdom, his kingdom. So he would have said sons of the kingdom to contrast sons of Johanna. It was like someone choosing to live in the filth and corruption of the garbage dump outside the city rather than inside the city and the safety and the comfort of the city itself. So the reality of the world's ways is that it is like the city dump, the landfill, the sewer, while the kingdom is like the city. In Deuteronomy 4.2, it says, Moses, or Moses is speaking to the Israelites, and it says, You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. So I was wondering how the first scribes and Pharisees came about. You know, could they have truly loved the Lord? You know, because they weren't here the whole time. So could they have truly loved the Lord and something happened to make them insecure and, you know, or they or someone that they loved sinned in a way that was, um, and they were ridiculed to a point where shame and condemnation took over. So they, at that moment, decided to make all these other rules to keep them inside the boundary lines, you know. And so... I see us, sometimes we do that. We make boundaries for ourselves, which boundaries there's nothing wrong with. But we can't keep focused on the boundaries because if you're, if you're focused on Jesus, then you're going to stay within the boundaries that he provides. You know, but it's like we focus so much on the boundaries, the laws, the rules. Well, that's not going to keep us from sinning. Um, so... Like I said, when we're fixated on the boundaries and not the destination, which is Jesus, we affect those around us and make everyone about, make it about our own strength. I can't stand here with, you know, without Holy Spirit. I can't stand here without Jesus. And um, my boundary, it would have been, I'm, this is the boundary. I'm sitting at the table. I'm not coming up here. <laughs> that would have been my boundary. Um, so I wonder if this is what happened to him, you know. The more we strive to stay out of the garbage pile watching the boundary line, the more likely we're going to fall into it. And um, because we can't see the obstacles that are coming to us, you know, we can't see what we need to go around. If we're watching here, we can't see the attacks, you know, because we're not focused on Jesus. The men in Acts 15 and us today have to ask ourselves, what are we looking at? Are we looking at the rules or Jesus? If we focus on Jesus, like I said, more times than not, we'll stay within the boundaries that he has set for us. So this question arose, must the Gentiles follow um, the law of Moses to enter the kingdom? So I just imagine, you know, here's the apostles and the elders, and you got Paul and Barnabas and James and all these other people. And with all these other people, you have all these other opinions. Um, And so I can just hear it now. It said, well, Jesus told us, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And then someone else says, yeah, but do you not remember him telling the rich young ruler, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery. If he said we still have, if, 
If he said we still needed to do these things, what about when God told Abraham, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people? He has broken my covenant. And the next person, yeah, but, yeah, but, and so on and so forth. So in that moment, I see Holy Spirit just whisper to and say, hey, Peter, remind them of what I did. Remind them. So in verse 7, it says, And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent. So Paul was speaking about whenever he was sent to Cornelius' house by the Holy Spirit, approximately 11 years before this happened. Um, and these were all uncircumcised Gentiles. God knew their heart, and that, you know, knew their heart, their desires, their um, thoughts and feelings and their intentions. God knows that about us. They didn't verbalize anything to anyone, and he knew and poured out his spirit on them. So that's what he wants. That's what he wanted from them. That's what he wanted from Abraham when he made the covenant with him. You know, he wanted Abraham to have a heart to do whatever he asked. And he wants our hearts. And we have to ask, are we willing to give him what he wants? God wants a heart of surrender. He wants uh, us to surrender our desires and our thoughts and our feelings and our want-tos and our fears and he wants us to surrender whatever it is, everything that is of us, of the flesh. So in my opinion, this is one of the reasons that we're not bound to the law, because God knows that if our heart is in the position, in the proper position, then we will give control to whatever he asks of. He asks each of us different things at different times in our walk with him, and some are written in the laws and some aren't. Um, I mean, he asked me to move to Amarillo an hour away from my grandbaby. That's nowhere in the book, you know. He'll ask you to do something different that he won't ever ask me to do. He just asks us to submit. To submit. So now that God has everyone's attention, I can see Holy Spirit whisper to Barnabas and Paul and then to James. He says, tell them. Verse 12 they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simon Peter has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophet agree, just as it is written. Isaiah 55.11 states, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish which that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Again, the Pharisees knew scripture, so they would have had this in the back of their mind, or the forefront of their mind, actually. Um, they would have known, and I feel like this next statement was directed to them from James. James spoke what was said by the prophet Amos. He says, And this I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will re rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who call are called by the name by my, by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. So James is just saying, you know, the prophets have said that it's for all mankind. Jesus is, the kingdom is. At this time, James gave his recommendations to the apostles and the leaders for the Gentiles, which they all agreed. 
verse 22 to 24, it says, then, they, then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send to them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas and Barsabas and Silas, which were leading men among the brothers, with the following letters. It says, The brothers and both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, <coughs> greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling in your minds, although we have gave them no instruction. So that's the first part of it. I just want to stop there for a second. In verse 24, it starts off with the apostles and the elders speaking. The apostles are the ten remaining um, disciples of Jesus plus Matthias who replaced Judas. At this point in time, James had been martyred. And the elders are leaders of the church in Jerusalem. So they would have been Jews who had been taught by the um, apostles or possibly by Jesus himself before he ascended. Um, these men's main purpose was to share Jesus and to make disciples. So it goes on to say that we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words. The word troubled here, used in the Greek, means to render anxious or distressed. It says their minds were unsettled. And this word in the Greek is only used this one time in the Bible. It means to move something out of its place. It refers to people with false theology trying to rearrange the theology of someone else. So if you'd allow me to like rewrite it just a little bit using what we've learned. It says, we who are closest, who were closest to Jesus and have given the have been given the responsibilities to guide you according to his word, right to you. We have heard that some persons have gone out representing themselves to you from the church and have caused you to be confused and distressed about the teachings you have received. Be assured that they have come with false theology, <coughs> trying to rearrange the thoughts, the truth, sorry, the truth that you have received, for w which is, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a res as a result of works, so that no one may boast. The disciples possibly went on to say, Jesus told us himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me, ex ex no one comes to the Father except through me. So I can't say it enough. We have to know who we're allowing to speak. And we have to make sure that Holy Spirit is leading us in what we believe the Word says. So moving on to verse 25. It says, It has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you about the same thing by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So I asked myself, why would the apostles and leaders decide to... Um, on these requirements. Well, and after my initial thought and reading a bunch of other people's opinions, I come up with what Jesus said in Matthew 22. It says, You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So in the council's letter, they wrote, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and sexual immorality. 
Well, I see abstaining from what's been sacrificed to idols and um, sexual immorality. That's under the great and first commandment. When they directed the Gentiles to abstain from sacrifices offered to idols, they were specifically talking about food. And at the beginning of your walk, you know how easily it is to get led astray from or go back to your old ways. And the Gentiles would have been accustomed to go into festivals and celebrations that this happened. And so by staying away from the festivals and celebrations of non-believers during these times, it was easier to keep on track and allow the love of God to take and not allow the love of God to take second place. The newly converted Gentiles were also instructed to abstain from sexual immorality. And this wasn't only, they didn't have just to do with like um, sex before marriage or same sex attraction. It didn't have any, all just to do with that. It had to do with um, who in your family you married. And uh, apparently the Gentiles like to marry people in their own family. So that's why they wanted to um, say that. You know, it's like they agreed with all this other stuff, but they didn't really agree with not marrying your sister or your brother or whatever. So that's where that come in. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, 19 says, Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin is a, pers a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Again, that goes under the loving God, you know. So they were also instructed to abstain from blood and from things that had been strangled. And this was very much a pagan practice and extremely offensive to the Jews. So these two, in my opinion, fall under the love your neighbors as yourself. Um, this would have been able, this would have started bridging the two groups together as one, as the true church, um, by first relying on Holy Spirit and coming together in the unity in Christ Jesus. They were able to encourage both the Jews and the Gentiles that were focused on glorifying the one true God. I want to point out how they made sure to write in the letter, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. You know, they wanted to emphasize to everyone that read this, we didn't do this on our own. We asked the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in this. And that's how all of our decisions should be made. So the apostles and elders sent Paul and Barnabas back to Antioch where they gathered everyone together to share what the council had concluded. In verse 31, just a few words, but they're very powerful. It says, And when they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. The Gentiles still were told that they were going to have to give things up, so that they were accustomed to doing. So why were they rejoicing? I think partly it's because they knew that um, what they were being told by these people weren't what God was telling them. So they were happy about that. They rejoiced in the fact that, okay, we, we were hearing, you know, right. Um, I wonder if Holy Spirit, you know, was telling them, don't listen to these men. What they're saying, it's not from me. They mean well, but they have not accepted the fullness of the cross for themselves. And so whenever someone hasn't received or accepted the fullness of the cross, the grace that goes with the cross, then they can't give what they haven't received. So this is why it's imperative again, that if we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we don't stop there. We've been told to repent, turn from our sinful ways toward God, acknowledge that Jesus is salvation, be baptized in Romans 6, 3, and 4, it says that when we are water baptized, we are buried with him into his death. Our old life is put away when we get water baptized. God made a way to help us keep the old man away. And that's through the power of the Holy Spirit. All four Gospels 
talked about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 3.11, this is John the baptizer speaking. It says, I baptized you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Holy Spirit is so many things for us, but a few of the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives is opening our minds and understanding the Word of God. Another is power and courage and the will to say no to the old ways of our living. We need Holy Spirit to do this life, or at least to do it well. Um, we'll finish with 35 and 32 to 35. It says, And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they sent they were sent off in peace by the prophet by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord, with many others also. It says in verse thirty two, Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. I really kind of debated on saying anything about this, um, because there's not enough time to give 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 it the time that it needs um this on spiritual gifts. But I do want to just scratch the surface a little bit. And if you're willing, hopefully go home and you know do a study on for yourself. And they said on Sunday, this is exciting. E three, just a little plug for E three. On Sundays they're gonna do a Bible study. They're teaching the Bible, like how to study the Bible. So if you don't know how, or if you want to learn more, come to that. Um, so in 32, it says that they themselves were prophets. They encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. Um, to be a prophet or to prophesy and to be an encourager or to exhort, they're all gifts of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Prophecy, it's a gift of communicating and reinforcing revealed truth. Don Stewart says, Exhortation is a gift that enables a person to encourage others to become mature in, Christ, in Jesus Christ. Those with the gift of exhortation will attempt to bring out the best in people. Indeed, it is to give them spiritual maturity. Exhortation includes rebuking fellow believers for their sins. It is not the same as teaching. It is a call to action. It's my belief that we should all be prophets and exhorters. If you know the Word of God, then you can and should prophesy while exhorting, encouraging the one you're talking to. We are called to do this. If my grandson says, I can't do that, y'all, y'all, it's too hard. My response should be, Jesus tells us that there will be times that it is too hard for us, but with God, all things are possible. We are made in his image, and you have the mind of Christ. You're an overcomer because of Christ Jesus, and so just ask him you know, to help you, and he will. And I'll stay here until you, know, you do that. So I just prophesied and encouraged <laughs> anyone can do it. It's not that hard. And that is if you know the word. You have to know the word to be able to do it. Um, so it just says uh, it takes the time to learn the word of God and then to show the love that we are called to in Matthew 22 prophecy and exhortation may not be your top given gift but Jesus instructed us to make disciples Jesus is not going to tell us to do something that God doesn't um, equip us to do. To make disciples, it requires prophecy and exhortation. We as humans make it more difficult than it is. Moses, he was a prophet who spoke to the Lord, saying, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in my past or since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow to speech and of tongue. <laughs> God was like, okay, and <laughs> go, <laughs> you know. So um, God will make a way if you are willing, if we are willing. 
As Eloise mentioned last time, Barnabas means son of encouragement. Barnabas made it his life mission to come alongside others, specifically um, Paul, and help them fulfill their purpose in Christ. Where would Paul be without Barnabas? You know, when he tried joining the disciples, the disciples were scared of him. They're like, no, we're not going to, you know, we don't want you here. But it was only because of Barnabas, only because Barnabas vouched for him that they believed. And 14 years later, they were still together. Barnabas was still encouraging Paul, and Paul was still, you know, doing his thing. All right, and this is it. Um, I have another friend that leads a woman's study at a different church, and I happened to be able to go last week. When I got there, I found out that they were reading a book by Pastor Dennis Rouse, I think is his name. It's called The Ten Qualities That Move You from Being a Believer to a Disciple. Now, I don't know anything about this book except for chapter four that we went over. So, um, But I really enjoyed a few of the things that he said. He says, I like to say it this way. The most important message to, un- to the unbeliever is Jesus. The most important message to the believer is Holy Spirit. Um, the difference between a believer and a disciple is how connected the person is to Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, God has given us the, mani- the magnificent gift of Holy Spirit to equip us, inspire us, and empower us. When we're filled with the Spirit, you'll experience more peace and patience. You'll have the power to love the unlovely, and you'll care for those. You'll care for the lost and the least. You'll long to know God more intimately, and you'll make Him your highest priority. He'll become your everything. So, if we want that, then we have to have Holy Spirit. And um, I wasn't planning on saying this, but I'm going to. Um, A few people know that I am really terrified of cameras. Just some stuff in my past, I just don't like them. And the only reason that I can stand here, because for the last three hours the enemy has been in my ear, is because Holy Spirit and what Holy Spirit has done for me. You know, and so um, if you don't know Holy Spirit, if you don't, you know, then, or if you just want to know him more, you know, please do that because you're not only hurting yourself, but all of those in your family around you by not having a true relationship with him. We have to realize that Holy Spirit is not just the spirit that floats around. I mean, we have a relationship. We can have that. We need that. So anyways, those are, I think that's about it. Um, We're going to finish there in the last few verses of 15. We'll go over that in chapter 16 next week.